Okay, so now let's um, continue on with some assessment. Let's talk about one other type of traumatic brain injury called the basal or skull fracture. It's not that common, but it has such starch characteristics that it's good to review it. And it also allows us to review um, the terminology associated with how this presents. So with a basal or skull fracture, the patients get what's called rhinorrhea and otorrhea, meaning CSF is gonna come out of their nose and their ears. And part of the assessment is to evaluate that CSF. And we're gonna talk about that. Also something called battle signs occurs, which is called periauricular ecchymosis, or in other words, there's bruising behind their ears. So this skull has been traumatized, causing the bruising to show up behind the ears and also around the eyes. So that's called raccoon's eyes, periauricular ecchymosis, and also the otorrhea and rhinorrhea. So that's called basal or skull fracture. So with any of the traumatic brain injuries, your priority assessment, of course, is always going to be the airway and is the patient breathing. Let's talk about assessment of the cerebral spinal fluid. If there is clear drainage coming from a patient, whether they're in the hospital bed or out in the field, depending on when the intervention takes place, what you wanna do is evaluate that clear fluid for glucose. Remember we talked about how CSF does contain glucose being an ultrafiltrate of plasma and other clear drainage that would be coming from the nose would not contain glucose. So that would help us discriminate what is coming out of the nose. If you're having a bloody drainage come out either from the nose or from the ear, you do a different type of test to test for the presence of CSF, and that is called the halo sign. So with the halo sign, what you do is put this drop of blood, because it's a bloody drainage, we wanna know if CSF is in it, and you put it on a gauze or some kind of white um, paper or gauze would be the best, and what happens in the halo sign is that the red blood cells stay in the center and the CSF migrates outward away from the red blood cells. So again, that is called the halo sign. Another important assessment is to evaluate patients' pupils. Are the pupils equal? Are they round? Do they react to light and do they accommodate? Remember we talked about how with that uncoiled type of herniation, you don't have bilateral pupil size. You have one side of pupil that's dilated and the other is not, it, that it's not. So this is when Perla becomes really very relevant and important. Another very important assessment is according to the Glasgow Coma Scale. You've probably learned this before in your assessment courses, but this is when you have to do a very thorough Glasgow Coma. Now Glasgow Coma Scale is great because it allows from practitioner to practitioner to have a universal way to evaluate your patient, even from the field to the nursing care, to the next nursing practitioner. You have a consistent way to evaluate the patient with consistent scale. So Glasgow Coma is gonna be universal in your assessment, whether that be in the ICU or elsewhere. So Glasgow Coma has three different categories, eye, motor, and verbal. So it's also really important to begin this discussion by making sure that you understand that when you go to evaluate your patient who's neurologically compromised, you don't go in there and give them really, you know, a lot of stimuli way up, right off the bat so they open their eyes. Remember, we want their baseline neurologic functioning. We want their baseline cognition. So when you first approach a patient to assess them, you go in there and you really just present yourself. You just walk in the room and you see if they open their eyes. So that would be spontaneously. Then if they don't open their eyes, we up the ante a little bit and we address them. Mr. Jones, we call them by name. Then we see if they open their eyes to sound. If they still don't respond to sound, which would be, you know, this is according to numbers, so make sure you're familiar with the numbers, then we go to pain. So pain gets a lower score. What does that mean? Sometimes practitioners will do a little sternal rub. Sometimes you can press underneath the fingernails. Don't be too cruel. Try to 
to elicit enough pain just to have a response, but not more pain than that, obviously. Um, sometimes you'll have practitioners put little pinpricks on their heels to see if that pain has the patient open their eyes. So that's eye. The next category is motor. So this is also a good time to discuss that posturing. So we'll talk about what I mean by that. So motor has six scales instead of four for I. So motor is um, the first one, a perfect score with a six would be that the patient does follow commands. Hold up two fingers, okay. Make sure though that you are asking them to do this bilaterally. Don't just have them hold up two fingers with the right arm and you, do, you don't know if they have um, motor um, compromise on the other side. So make sure if one side is able to follow the commands that the other side is also able to follow those commands. If they're not able to do that, then we go to pain. Do they localize the pain? So localize the pain meaning the patient knows exactly where you're eliciting this pain and that's a five. The next one down would be that they withdraw to pain. So they kind of localized it, but it's more of a nonspecific withdrawal to that stimuli. The next one down is when the patient does what's called posturing to this stimuli. So what's going to be a little bit of a better score is that the patient does what's called a decorticate posturing to pain. So they are responding. It's a much lower level of functioning, of course, than following commands, of course, than, f than localizing the pain, and definitely withdrawing the pain. What they're doing is kind of just a reflex response to the pain, which is that they assume this posturing. Now, this posturing where the elbows, elbows are bent and they are actually toward the core, and that's one way to distinguish and help remember which one is the corticate in which one is decerebrate is that the elbows are bent, the wrists are hyperpronated and internally rotated, the legs are straight or um, they're completely uh, stretched out, internally rotated. So that would be the corticate posturing. What would be worse than that would be if the patient does a decerebrate posturing. Another way that you can think about it is really from that pathophysiologic basis that patients that have um, increased pressure in their cerebral cortex, well, that's a better finding than having pressure all the way down on their cerebellum. So decorticate posturing is actually a better sign than, than decerebrate posturing. And then the worst score would be a one, which would be that they have no response at all. Now, if your patient is intubated and sedated, then obviously then they're not going to have a verbal score. Then you would just have subscores of this Glasgow coma, the eye and the motor. If they are able to speak, if they're not intubated and ventilated, then you would have a total score and also subscores. Verbal would be that they can speak to you, that they're completely coherent, four is disoriented, inappropriate, uh, just sounds, incomprehensible sounds, and that they are not vocal at all. A perfect score with four, six, and five would be 15. A minor traumatic brain injury would be 13 to 14. A moderate one would be a score of nine to 12. And below eight would be the worst score or a patient has coma.